Hey, what's up? Silas here. I'm going to be reading you something that was posted in The Atlantic. It's titled, We Are Living in a Failed State, with the subtitle of The Coronavirus Didn't Break America, It Revealed What Was Already Broken. And this is by George Packer, who is a staff writer of The Atlantic. Before I get into the reading, uh, let me give you some background on why I'm reading this, why I think it's important, and uh, thanks for coming, first of all, and thanks for taking your time to read this. Well, not read this, to listen to this, but that's actually part of my explanation of what happened. I'm glad I took my time to read this, because it led to me deciding to make this video, and then now I posted it up there, and then you've taken the time to click on it, and hopefully this can be beneficial for all parties involved. First, a little something about me my channel, the way I approach the world, there's two things. One is, I think most problems in the world exist not because of what X actually is, but because of how we define X. And right now, going on with this ongoing pandemic and all of the things that have come around it, I don't think it takes much convincing to any of you listening to this at this moment that many of the issues that have arisen around this, many of the disagreements, have come from the lack of being able to define what that thing is. Whether it's from the start with the CCP not being completely open with what was happening with this situation and giving the world enough information to define the potential threat, whether it is actually it getting out there and then scientists and people projecting not being able to completely identify what this does to the human body. In some cases, people are saying, look, like I've been saying this too, I'm saying, okay, look at the people who are actually dying. Look at the comorbidities of the people who are dying. Look at the age groups of the people that are dying. So I'm looking at, I don't have some of these things, so maybe I'm not as much in danger, but then I'm also not accounting for all the things that are undefined, like what is the lasting effect of having this on your body? I listened to a really nice podcast that I think you guys should check out, Dark Horse Podcast, and they were talking about how there actually is an effect where people have this false dichotomy that they look at the world, they say you're either sick or you're healed. And that's not necessarily it. You can get something that can slowly affect you, and then that affects you for the rest of your life and reduces your potential lifespan. And there's some things that you can reverse, some things that you can't reverse. So you get this CCP virus right now. What are the actual long-term effects? Those are things that we don't know. Yes, it might be killing older people right now, but then the younger people who have it may have issues down the road due to having had this. So there are many questions to talk about with something like that. But for the virus itself, dying immediately from it, I think people understand that even already when it comes back around in the next season, there was just something I saw in the recent White House uh, briefing where there was discussions where I think the head of the CC CDC had talked about how it's going to be more difficult when the coronavirus comes back around again in the fall, in the winter for this season because it will be there with the flu. Now, there's people who take that and say, oh my God, this is going to be horrible. It's going to be destructive. He's talking about another kind of Armageddon. We need to st keep things closed. Then there's other people who say, and he also came out and said, he said, look, we've been using the systems that we use to track the flu to track the CCP virus. So what we're saying is not that it's going to be an entire disaster. There's going to be more complications. We're going to have the added difficulty of actually saying this is stuff from flu and this is stuff from the CCP virus. So he's not necessarily saying we have to stay closed. It's just that there's going to be a different difficulty level in addressing the same issue that comes up. Two more things. Some people are defining this that we have to only open up once the virus has completely disappeared. That's probably not going to happen. This is probably going to be part of human society for the foreseeable future. That's how these things happen. The virus enters, and then we figure out how to deal with it as a society. Another one is I'm calling it the CCP virus. There was this whole hullabaloo about calling it the China virus or Trump calling it the China virus. Some people were saying that was racist, even though many people in the media had been calling it the Wuhan flu, had been calling it the China virus for months. And then when Trump started saying it, it started being like, oh, this is racist. This is getting Chinese people or people of Asian descent to be attacked on the streets. How are they actually defining those attacks? I don't know. I haven't actually heard of the actual text because I'm seeing what police are doing to people in here in Nairobi, Kenya. And those things are outright attacks. But if it's done by the police, it's not necessarily held as that negative of a thing because hey, it's the state. So they have this system and they have the ability to have this monopoly of force over any given area. So when they do it, it's protection. But coming back to this, the hullabaloo about calling the thing, the Chinese Communist 
party realize that if you tie this to China, there are actual abilities of that having an effect on how people view the country, view the result of the place. There is an aspect of that. I don't think that is racial, and that's why I'm changing it to be the Chinese Communist Party virus, because it is not about all the Chinese people in a whole. It is not about people of Chinese genetic descent who might never have ever lived in China and may not even know Mandarin Chinese or anything or anything to do with Chinese culture. It's about the people in the Chinese Communist Party and what that system has done, the way they feel they have to save face, the way the system actually is a situation where they can't actually handle some of these things. Is it even a state? It's, you, need to, you need to be a state first to be a failed state. They don't have the ability to do this. So that's what I'm talking about with the whole situation of how you define something kind of raises issues in many different ways. And I think that's where most of the problems come. And if we can have come to an understanding on what something actually is, it deals with much of the problems that arise from that. The second one is people literally mean things figuratively, especially when it comes to, in my experience, Americans, although I have most experience in my life with Americans, it just seems that they do it a lot more. And specifically when they're talking about political issues, much of what they say is not literally what they say. That was one of my first videos, and it has literally still been one of the main formative things that I just approached the world with, trying to be like, okay, what do you actually mean by this? And I think you'll see that as I'm reading this thing, because I am reading this, and it's just, okay, I'm going to add a third thing. There's a third thing that I think helps me. Different things happen for the same reasons, or the same things happen for different reasons. Because with this George Packer thing that I'm going to get into reading now, there's things I agree with him. In this title, we are living in a failed state. The coronavirus didn't break America. It revealed what was already broken. Okay, I don't necessarily think it's a failed state, especially not literally, but he figuratively means that I don't know what George Packer means by failed state. I don't even know what he means by state in this situation because I don't think he would agree. I don't, I'm not quite sure he would agree with what I define as a state, which is a, a sort of organization that has a monopoly of violence over any given area. Most people don't actually say, mean that when they actually speak a state. So the coronavirus did break America. How do you define break? I don't necessarily think America is broken. And it reveals what was already broken. I definitely think in that situation, much of the issues being brought up, mostly around Trump and mostly around the issues right now, they're not issues that came up just because Trump was there. But I think with Trump being president, it has brought a situation where some of these things are more focused on. I think if there was a president that was more media friendly or that was less divisive or less of a character that people felt very open to just malign and talk about openly, there would have been certain people covering for certain aspects of the government. Simple example, there's things that other countries have done that have been covered in different ways that Trump did better on. There's governors and people like that who had the power and ability to shut down their states. And if they had shut down their state earlier with pretty much the same sort of information Trump was privy to, would Trump have come in and said, no, you have to stay open? Right now, if Trump says he has to open the state, we have to open the country, does that mean if a governor wanted to keep it closed, keep his state closed, that Trump would force them to stay open? I don't think he would. How would he do this? So there's some things in there, but the fact that Trump has made it so comfortable for people to go out and just talk about the state in a certain way, seeing states actually embracing states' rights, talking about the 10th Amendment and things like that. That is a fantastic thing to me, and that is part of the Trump effect. So this thing, there's some things I agree with him, but you have to keep in mind that literally mean things figuratively. Different things happen for the same reason. The reason problems occur is because of how we define X rather than what X is. Keep those in mind as I read these. I know this is a long preamble before I get to the reading. But I think you'll see why. And I'm tempted to get somewhat dramatic in the reading because this just started from having the coronavirus memes on Facebook. And somebody posted this meme I'll put it on the screen right now. Just that simple, it's a simple kind of stick man figure or something. It's like Karen's. Then he's reaching out to this bubble saying, I hope these protesters get COVID-19 and die. And then there's that little creature thing with the emotions back, little big blue pink creature behind him in the next frame. And he's got that little worry kind of looking back and saying, because if you don't, it means you were wrong and they were right. And then somebody came into the comment section and posted this and said, I know Trump tards won't read this, and really, who cares? But hopefully others will. I'm a pretty tough guy, but I couldn't finish the article. If you're reasonably intelligent, 
But if you're a reasonable, talented person, you can decipher truth from bullshit. The author, I think, nailed it. Definitely worth the read. So I just went in there. I was kind of making fun of him. Like, I was just wondering what kind of comment is. Like, who are you trying to communicate to? So in my response, I kind of just wrote, like, I was writing this from, I'm saying this from a Trump Tarts position. I was like, oh, man, you really got me. I'll show him by reading this article. I'm showing him that he both has good enough ability to decipher truth and value of an article without even finishing it. Though even if he knows the difference between a tough guy and a Trump Tart, I'll show him not only by being able to read it, but to <laughs> finishing it, and then I'll show it to him. So, <laughs> so anyway, I'm just kind of mocking with this thing. But then I decided, hey, let me actually read this. And I had some thoughts on it, so I decided, let me actually read it out loud, and I'll give you my thoughts on it after. Into the reading. We are living in a failed state. The coronavirus didn't break America. It revealed what was already broken. And this is by George Packer. Staff writer for The Atlantic, and it's part of their special preview for the June 2020 issue. And I'm reading this from the website. It opens up with this uh, really cool picture of an uh, American flag on uh, one of those medical type of poles, so where you call the IV thing, so it's, that's the flagpole being held for it. So it's a nice picture by Oliver Monday. So here we go. When the virus came here, it found a country with serious underlying conditions, and it exploited them ruthlessly. Chronic ills, that is, a corrupt political class, a sclerotic bureaucracy, a heartless economy, a divided and distracted public, had gone untreated for years. We had learned to live uncomfortably with the symptoms. It took the scale and intimacy of a pandemic to expose their severity, to shock Americans with the recognition that we are in the high-risk category. The crisis demanded a response that was swift, rational, and collective. The United States reacted instead like Pakistan or Belarus, like a country with shoddy infrastructure and a dysfunctional government whose leaders were too corrupt or too stupid to head off mass suffering. The administration squandered two irretrievable months to prepare. From the president came willful blindness, scapegoating, boasts, and lies. From his mouthpieces, conspiracy theories, and miracle cures. A few senators and corporate executives acted quickly, not to prevent the coming disaster, but to profit from it. When a government doctor tried to warn the public of the danger, the White House took the mic and politicized the message. Every morning in the endless month of March, Americans woke to find themselves citizens of a failed state, with no rational plan, no coherent instructions at all. Families, schools, and offices were left to decide on their own whether to shut down and take shelter. When test kits, masks, gowns, and ventilators were found to be in desperately short supply, governors pleaded for them with the White House, which stalled, then called on private enterprise, which couldn't deliver. Civilians took out their sewing machines to try and keep ill-equipped hospital workers healthy and their patients alive. Russia, Taiwan, and the United Nations sent humanitarian aid to the world's richest power, a beggar nation in utter chaos. Donald Trump saw the crisis almost entirely in personal and political terms. Fearing for his re-election, he declared the coronavirus pandemic a war and himself a wartime president. But the leader he brings to mind is Marshal Philippe Pétain, the French general who in 1940 signed an armistice with Germany after its rout of French defenses, then formed the pro-Nazi Vichy regime. Like Pétain, Trump collaborated with the invader and abandoned his country to a prolonged disaster. And like France in 1940, America in 1920. Okay, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm, try, I'm, 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 ugh. Ah, I'm, I'm hoping you can see why I'm trying to put the dramatic, the dramatic take on this. And I just wanted to read it through, but this, this stuff really sickens me. And I checked and this, this George Packard guy, he was uh, George Packer. He was he was born in 1960. So I'm I'm thinking he should know better. I mean, he's he's equating he's equating what was happening in France in 1940 to what's happening in the United States of America right now. This is part of that literally Hitler thing that just that just breaks me off. I have to keep reminding himself he means it figuratively. He can't mean this literally. He can't literally mean that he thinks America is as devastated as France was after that. Like he can't, he can't, you can't, you can't literally mean that no one can literally believe this. But then when the person who posted this was talking about he couldn't read this because it was like too tough for him. I'm like, what, what kind of world, what, what are you seeing? What, what are you seeing out there that I'm not seeing? Okay, 
Back to the reading. And, like France in 1940, America in 1920 has stunned itself with a collapse that's larger and deeper than one miserable leader. Some future autopsy of the pandemic might be called Strange Defeat, after the historian and resistant fighter Mark Bloch's contemporaneous study of the fall of France. Despite countless examples around the United States of individual courage and sacrifice, the failure is national. And it should force a question that most Americans have never had to ask. Do we trust our leaders and one another enough to summon a collective response to a mortal threat? Are we still capable of self-government? This is the third major crisis of the short 21st century. The first, on September 11th, 2001, came when Americans were still living mentally in the previous century, and the memory of depression, world war, and cold war remained strong. On that day, people in the rural heartland did not see New York as an alien stew of immigrants and liberals that deserved its fate, but as a great American city that had taken a hit for the whole country. Firefighters from Indiana drove 800 miles to help the rescue effort at Ground Zero. Our civic reflex was to mourn and mobilize together. Partisan politics and terrible policies, especially in the Iraq war, eased the sense of national unity and fed a bitterness towards a political class that never faded. The second crisis in 2008 intensified it. At the top, the financial crash would almost be considered a success. Congress passed a bipartisan bailout bill that saved the financial system. Outgoing Bush administration officials cooperated with incoming Obama administration officials. The experts at the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department used monetary and fiscal policy to prevent a second Great Depression. Leading bankers were shamed but not prosecuted. Most of them kept their fortunes and some their jobs. Before long, they were back in business. A Wall Street trader told me that the financial crisis had been a quote-unquote speed bump. All of the lasting pain was felt in the middle and at the bottom by Americans who had taken on debt and lost their jobs, homes, and retirement savings. Many of them never recovered, and young people who came of age in the Great Recession are doomed to be poorer than their parents. Inequality, the fundamental relentless force in American life since the late 1970s grew worse. The second crisis drove a profound wedge between Americans, between the upper and lower classes, Republicans and Democrats, metropolitan and rural people, the native-born and immigrants, ordinary Americans and their leaders. Social bonds had been under growing strain for several decades, and now they began to tear. The reforms of the Obama years, important as they were, in healthcare, financial regulation, green energy, had only palliative effects. The long recovery over the past decade enriched corporations and investors, lulled professionals, and left the working class further behind. The lasting effect of the slump was to increase polarization and to discredit authority, especially governments. Both parties were slow to grasp how much credibility they'd lost. The coming politics was populist. Its harbinger wasn't Barack Obama, but Sarah Palin, the absurdly unready vice presidential candidate who scorned expertise and reveled in celebrity. She was Donald Trump's John the Baptist. Another short aside here, they're talking about people being unprepared, and I was just making an observation how in current year when I'm reading this, Joe Biden hasn't picked his vice presidential candidate yet, but he did say it was going to be a female. And I was thinking, whoever the youngish type of person that he picks, at least youngish for a politician, not compared to Joe Biden, who's like 78, will be the pretty much current year Democrat version of the mccain Palin ticket from 2008. And you see here they're talking about unprepared and not unqualified, because if you're talking about unqualified, there have been calls to have Michelle Obama be the vice presidential candidate. And what is Michelle Obama's political actual expertise? What are her qualifications? Or people would say, she's been prepared because she was the president's wife for eight years, just like Hillary Clinton was the most qualified person because of her political stuff, plus being the first lady for that amount of time. Double standards are garbage. Back to the reading. Trump came to power as a repudiation of the Republican establishment. 
but the conservative political class and the new leader soon reached an understanding. Whatever their differences on issues like trade and immigration, they shared a basic goal, to strip mine public assets for the benefit of private interests. Republican politicians and donors who wanted government to do as little as possible for the common good could live happily with a regime that barely knew how to govern at all. And they made themselves Trump's footmen. Like a wanton boy throwing matches in a parched field, Trump began to emulate what was left of national civic life. He never even pretended to be president of the whole country, but pitted us against one another along lines of race, sex, religion, citizenship, education, region, and every day of his presidency, political party. His main tool of governance was to lie. A third of the country locked itself in a hall of mirrors that it believed to be reality. A third drove itself mad with an effort to hold on to the idea of knowable truth. And a third gave up on even trying. I wonder what part he considers himself to be part of. I mean, definitely not the mirror part. I think he would want, to, I think he would consider himself to be in that second part. Back to the reader. Trump acquired a federal government crippled by years of right-wing ideological assault, politicization by both parties, and steady defunding. He set about finishing off the job and destroying the professional civil service. He drove out some of the most talented and experienced career officials, left essential positions unfilled, and installed loyalists as commissars over the cowed survivors with one purpose, to serve his own interests. His major legislative accomplishment, one of the largest tax cuts in history, sent hundreds of billions of dollars to corporations and the rich. The beneficiaries who flocked to patronize his resorts and line his re-election pockets. If lying was his means for using power, corruption was his end. This was the American landscape that lay open to the virus. In prosperous cities, a class of globally connected desk workers dependent on a class of precarious and invisible service workers. In the countryside, decaying communities in revolt against the modern world. On social media, mutual hatred and endless vituperation among different camps. In the economy, even with full employment, a large growing gap between triumphant capital and beleaguered labor. In Washington, an empty government led by a conman and his intellectually bankrupt party. Around the country, a mood of cynical exhaustion with no vision of shared identity or future. If the pandemic really is a war, it's the first to be fought on this soil in a century and a half. Invasion and occupation expose a society's fault lines, exaggerating what goes unnoticed or accepted in peacetime, clarifying essential truths, raising the smell of buried rot. The virus should have united Americans against a common threat. With different leadership, it might have. Even as it spread from blue to red areas, attitudes broke down along familiar partisan lines. The virus also should have been a great leveler, you don't have to be in the military or in debt to be a target. You just have to be human. But from the start, its effects have been skewed by the inequality we've tolerated for too long. When tests for the virus were almost impossible to find, the wealthy and connected, for example, model and reality TV host Heidi Klum, the entire roster of the Brooklyn Nets, the president's conservative allies, were somehow able to get tested, despite many showing no symptoms. The smattering of individual's results did nothing to protect public health. Meanwhile, ordinary people with fevers and chills had to wait in long and possibly infectious lines, only to be turned away because they weren't actually suffocating. An internet joke proposed that the only way to find out whether you had the virus was to sneeze in a rich person's face. When Trump was asked about this blatant unfairness, he expressed disapproval but added, quote, Perhaps that's been the story of life. Unquote. Most Americans hardly register this kind of special privilege in normal times. But in the first weeks of the pandemic, it sparked outrage, as if during global general mobilization, the rich had been allowed to buy their way out of military service and hoard gas masks. As the contagion has spread, its victims have been likely to be poor, black, and brown people. The gross inequality of our healthcare system is evident in the sight of refrigerated trucks lined up outside public hospitals. 
Another short aside here, this might be America-centric, of course, because when you look all over the world, the people who've actually died the most were men. I do not think this person would consider this, George Packer, would consider that to be a sign of global sexism against men. But in the United States of America, for various reasons, they have been something where black and brown people, minorities in the United States of America, have a higher number of infections. And this, I think, is in part due to minorities being predominantly living in those blue areas that he mentioned, which is the large cities with a lot of people living close to each other and the jobs that some of them have. Interestingly enough, due to the sort of testing that's been done in certain places and the tracking that's been done, I think... I'm not quite sure, but I think white people probably have died the most out of anyone. If you want to accept China's numbers, which I do not. But white people are only 9% of the global population, but their countries are the ones that are following this the most, so have the highest numbers. They're doing much more testing, so that is something that you'd expect. Here in Kenya, we have about, I think, 30 dead right now, and maybe a few thousand. I think it's about uh, 5,000 found with the virus that they're in different quarantines and things like that. Do I think... Only 5,000 people out of the 45 million people in Kenya have the virus? I don't think so, but it's due to testing, and I'm hoping numbers come in. Back to the reading. We now have two categories of work, essential and non-essential. Who have the essential workers turned out to be? Mostly people in low-paying jobs that require their physical presence and put their health directly at risk. Warehouse workers, shelf stalkers, Instacart shoppers, delivery drivers, municipal employees, hospital staffers, home health aides, long-haul truckers, doctors and nurses are the pandemic's combat heroes. But the supermarket cashier with her bottle of sanitizer and the UPS driver with his latex gloves are the supply and logistics troops who keep the frontline forces intact. In a smartphone economy that hides whole classes of human beings, we're learning where the food and goods come from. Who keeps this alive? An order of organic baby arugula from Amazon Fresh is cheap and arrives overnight in part because the people who grow it, sort it, pack it, and deliver it have to keep working while sick. For more service workers, sick leave turns out to be an impossible luxury. It's worth asking if we would accept a higher price and slower delivery so that they could stay home. And as I'm reading this, there's different adverts on it because if you, if you use ad block on certain things and certain sites, they don't let you have to read the article. But before, there was a part where they're talking about the chaos, like, oh, it's left the country in chaos. And then the next ad is like, oh, new chic, buy this uh, sweater and these shoes and things. So this, that dichotomy, it's like, yes, the country is in chaos, but hey, you can still order this, just like you mentioned here. You can still get Amazon. That is really chaotic. That is totally that is totally like France in 1940. It's completely a mess. It's completely a disaster. That is totally something that I can see why you said that, George. I can see why you say that, Mr. Packer. That is totally what you're talking about. That is, that is the same thing. It's totes the same thing. Back to reading. The pandemic has also clarified the meaning of non-essential worker. One example is Kelly Lawfer, the Republican junior senator from Georgia, whose sole qualification for the empty seat that she was given in January is her immense wealth. Less than three weeks into the job, after dire private briefing about the virus, she got even richer from selling off stocks. Then she accused Democrats of exaggerating the danger and gave her, con her constituents false assurances that may well have gotten them killed. Lawfer's imp impulses in public service are those of a dangerous parasite, a body politic that would place someone like this in high office is well advanced in decay. The purest embodiment of political nihilism is not Trump himself, but his son-in-law and senior advisor, Jared Kushner. In his short lifetime, Kushner has been fraudulently promoted as both a meritocrat and a populist. He was born into a moneyed real estate family the month Ronald Reagan entered the Oval Office in 1981, a princeling of the Second Gilded Age. Despite Jared's mediocre academic record, he was admitted to Harvard after his father, Charles, pledged a $2.5 million donation to the university. Father helped son with $10 million in loans for a start in the family business. Then, Jared continued his elite education at the law and business schools of NYU, where his father had contributed $3 million. Jared repaid his father's support with fierce loyalty when Charles was sentenced to two years in federal prison in 2005 
for trying to resolve a family legal quarrel by entrapping his sister's husband with a prostitute and videotaping the encounter. Okay, now that is some dicey stuff. <laughs> We're going to get into a lot about Jared Kushner here. And I just want to say, like, for Jared Kushner, for me, that's one of the question marks. And for me, I really think Donald Trump really, really loves his family and has a weakness for his daughter, Ivanka. Just like, I really care about my kids. My kids want this. I'm going to help out my kids. And I think that's the way Jared Kushner... Jared Kushner has always seemed kind of suspect to me. That's one thing I'm like, eh, a bit suspicious. So some of this stuff is garbage. We've seen what happened with the whole, like, school scandal... Some of these people with such an importance in saying, oh, you need to be educated. You need to have good grades. Oh, this person came from this and this school. But then they talk about things like this, about those schools that are just corrupt as crap. Or they're corrupt as all hell. They have these institutions as well. And it's not just, oh, we're just going to take Republican rich kids. They do Democrat rich kids too. We saw what was happening with the whole influencing from all levels. People in private sector, people in the public sector, celebrities, all these sorts of people are involved in this thing. And it's, it's a bad situation. Back to this. Jared Kushner failed as a skyscraper owner and a newspaper publisher, but he always found someone to rescue him, and his self-confidence only grew. In American Oligarchs, Andrea Bernstein describes how he adopted the outlook of risk-taking entrepreneur as a quote-unquote disruptor of the new economy. Under the influence of his mentor, Rupert Murdoch, he found ways to fuse his financial, political, and journalistic pursuits. He made conflicts of interest his business model. So when his father-in-law became president, Kushner quickly gained power in an administration that raised amateurism, nepotism, and corruption to governing principles. As long as he busied himself with Middle East peace, his feckless meddling didn't matter to most Americans. But since he became an influential advisor to Trump on the coronavirus pandemic, the result has been mass death. In his first week on the job, in mid-March, Kushner co-authored the worst Oval Office speech in memory, interrupted the vital work of other officials, may have compromised security protocols, flirted with conflicts of interest and violations of federal law, and made fatuous promises that quickly turned to dust. Quote, the federal government is not designed to solve all our problems, unquote, he said explaining how he would tap his corporate connections to create drive-through testing sites. They never materialized. He was convinced by corporate leaders that Trump should not use his presidential authority to compel industries to manufacture ventilators. Then Kushner's own attempt to negotiate a deal with General Motors fell through. With no loss of faith in himself, he blamed shortages of necessary equipment and gear on incompetent state governors. Another aside here, maybe the whole support of Trump has to use his presidential powers wasn't necessarily Trump should shut down the states and tell the governments what to do, but it's Trump should tell the private sector what to do, nationalize things in that sense. And if Trump can do these things, then you have to admit for Trump to be able to tell companies what to do things, it has to be a wartime state. So if you're questioning whether it's accurate that Trump said he's a wartime president, then why are you expecting Trump to actually be able to go out there and tell General Motors what to do? And then you'd have that turnaround where when Trump is like, oh, Trump is trying to open the economy again. Oh, you can't tell the states to open up. What what do, what do you want? What is just be be consistent? But what are you basing on? They have to be, I think people want to be consistent. So I'm wondering what is the consistent thing that he's basing on? Like if I'm talking to somebody who's religious, who's a Christian, I understand their worldview is based on the Bible. So their worldview itself is based on something that might not be quite logical, but it has its own consistent things if you understand what that Bible is and how they read the Bible. So part of me doing these videos and talking about these things and talking to people like this is trying to understand what is their Bible? What is their dogma? How are they approaching the world? What are they translating things through? Okay, back to the reading. And yeah, this this thing coming up with Jared Kushner, like I may be somewhat biased to him, but this is this is a rather, <laughs> this is, okay, the last part, the dilettante part, I don't know, but th this first part, it starts off to watch this pale, slim-suited Pale, slim suit, and his very accurate description of Jared Kushner. I don't know about the dilettante part. Anyway, back into the reading. To watch this pale, slim suited dilettante breeze into the middle of a deadly crisis, dispensing bitter. <laughs> pale, slim suited dilettante. That is, that, is, that, is, that is excellent. That is an excellent insult. I feel like I need to know somebody in my life to, to insult them and call them that. Anyway, back to the reading. <laughs> To watch this pale, slim-suited dilettante breeze into the middle of a deadly crisis, dispensing business school jargon to cloud the massive failure of his father-in-law's administration, 
is to see the collapse of a whole approach to governing. It turns out that scientific experts on, and other civil servants are not traitorous members of a quote-unquote deep state. They're essential workers, and marginalizing them in favor of ideologies and sycophants is a threat to the nation's health. It turns out that quote-unquote nimble companies can't prepare for a catastrophe or distribute life-saving goods. Only a competent federal government can do that. It turns out that everything has a cost, and years of attacking government, squeezing it dry and draining its morale, inflict a heavy cost that the public has to pay in lives. All the programs defunded, stockpiles depleted, and plans scrapped meant that we had become a second-rate nation. Then came the virus and the strange defeat. Article's almost over, but it's like this little tinge comes in in the situation, and like, wow, why are you, blah, blah, blah. What, what is he talking about here? He's talking about how, like, okay, these, these supposedly nimble companies, no, nimbly, bimbly, <laughs> the thing from, from Super Troopers, I'm like a cat, are you a cat, dude, I'm jumping from a tree all mimbly, bimbly, the whole, like, meow thing, anyway, hilarious movie, <laughs> this thing, what are you talking about here? The companies, what environment were the companies living in? What environment was it? These companies, these other people might have been able to do these things they might have been prepared for this thing if they had been allowed to we don't have that we don't have that world that did not have as much regulation and as much government as much public sector influence that actually had the public sector was claiming to do this the world health organization was claiming to do this the united nations was claiming to do this that the key question back here is the key question back the way he asks are we able to have self-governance? Should we have trust in the government? That is a key thing, and I think that, 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 is, that is a very key thing. I, I, I'll come back to that at the end of this. We've got two more paragraphs to go. Let's get into it, and let's finish this up, huh? The fight to overcome the pandemic must also be a fight to recover the health of our country and build it anew, or the hardship and grief we're now enduring will never be redeemed. Under our current leadership, nothing will change. If 9-11 and 2008 wore out trust in the old political establishment, 2020 should kill off the idea that anti-politics is our salvation. But putting an end to this regime, so necessary and deserved, is only the beginning. We're faced with a choice that the crisis makes inescapably clear. We can stay hunkered down in self-isolation, fearing and shunning one another, letting our common bond wear away to nothing. Or we can use this pause in our normal lives to pay attention to the hospital workers holding up cell phones so their patients can say goodbye to the loved ones. The plane load of medical workers flying from Atlanta to help in New York. The aerospace workers in Massachusetts demanding that their factory be converted to ventilator production. The Floridians standing in long lines because they couldn't get through by phone to the skeletal unemployment office. The residents of Milwaukee braving endless waits hail, and contagion to vote in an election forced on them by partisan justices. We can learn from these dreadful days that stupidity and injustice are lethal, that, in a democracy, being a citizen is essential work, that the alternative to solidarity is death. After we've come out of hiding and taken off our masks, we should not forget what it was like to be alone. So that's it. And this article says it appears in the June 2020 print edition with under the headline, Underlying Conditions. And as I said, this was from uh, George Packer, a staff writer with Atlantic. He's the author of Our Man, Richard Holbrook, and the End of the American Century, and Unwinding an Inner History of the New America. So there's some things I definitely agree with in this article, but the thing is how you define it. The problems I agree with, but they're... Problem with the problems that <laughs> that rise from this is we might agree with X, but we don't define that X in the same way. We do agree that the system was messed up. Like people should have done better. Humans can do better at this. There is a better way to be prepared for something like this. Whatever this thing turns out to be, I don't think many people will argue that this was the best humans can do. It might have been the best humans could do with the way we were looking at the world. But I think one thing this does, it's a situation that is going to take people and let people take pause and look at the world and say, let's do certain things in different ways. Let's look at better ways to do these. He's talking about like here he talks about, oh, it's anti-government, but then he's equating government with state. 
I am more towards anarcho-capitalism. I've been making a mistake of equating politics with the state. What we see right there, this deep state does exist. There is an actual deep state, no matter what this person wants to say. Now, this person might de define the members of deep state as something else. But when somebody else is talking about deep state, I'm talking about the underlying bureaucracy that limits these things. You look at actually what the CDC did in that place. Were they doing things in a good way? When you're comparing this with other countries, what is he talking about? Is he talking about that, oh, in other countries where people were more pro-government and more welcoming of their government, look how well they did. Are you saying China is a lot more welcoming of their governance and then that happened and now you trust what happened out of China? Like, what is he comparing? What is he saying should be the future? And those are the questions we're going to have to ask each other all over the world. Who do we want to be more like? What do we want to be more from? How are we going to demand things from our politicians? And as I was mentioning, I've been mistaking politicians with state official, but you can have governments. As an anarcho-capitalist, you're still pro -go you're still pro governance. You're still pro pro laws. When you're talking about the democracy, what kind of democracy are you talking about? Do you want a full-on individual democracy where everyone votes on what they have and you have that kind of individualism so there isn't any state and all these centralized powers doing this and this? That's probably not what he wants. He wants a situation where it's like 50% plus one can decide what the others do. What do 50% plus one decide to have the others as slaves? Is that all of a sudden okay? I don't think this person would support that. I don't think George Packer would support that. I don't know the guy, but I just don't think he would actually support that. So in this situation, when you're talking about what should be done for this, what, what does George think about the governing system that he thinks should exist? If it's this so-called democracy of people voting to get people in certain positions, yet he doesn't want those people to have those powers and to decide by themselves, what about the system does he think selects for a government that would be best at handling these things and setting the regulations and organizing the, the, the private sectors in a country as massive as the United States of America, to have a centralized response? What does he think about this process that would select for that kind of, kind of person, that we should support more government? What is he defining as government in this situation? So these are my questions, some of my questions, some of my general observations of this. I mean, I, I did some of them as I was reading. I was like, I'm just going to read through, but then even reading through after having read it, it was like, ah, these things came to me. But why was he comparing United States to Pakistan and Belarus? And then later on goes to the France situation and switches around. Is he saying Pakistan and Belarus is compar comparative to what the United States of America is? Why isn't he comparing it to Western countries, to other contemporary countries? Why go to Pakistan and then they okay, Belarus is in Eastern Europe, but why go to that country? What, is, what are the similarities between those countries and the United States of America? Belarus with like 9.4 million people around there to a country with $325 million million people and more. What, what are the comparisons? Why not compare it to other Western democracies? Would he say that what Spain and Italy did was so much better than the United States of America? If there's similar things, if you can point out certain things that the government did for its people according to the information that was available and you go on the timeline and then you see, oh, Italy and and uh, Spain and these other countries, the United Kingdom, were this far back, we did this this much time after, it didn't control things in the way that you're saying they're supposed to control. Are you saying those countries are also failed states? Is that what he would say? Is that what George Packer would say? Is that what this person who posted would say? I'm not quite sure they would do that. So in my initial response when I was kind of just <laughs> making fun of him before I went into the more detailed ones, I asked him, why is he using Trump Tard and things like that? You know, why is he using, going with the Trump Tard? Oh, only intelligent people would be able to make out truth outside of bullshit. But no, not being able to understand something doesn't make you unintelligent. Somebody could be perfectly intelligent, but just not speak the language that you speak. We use these words. Like when I say Trump, what do you think about that? What, what, is it, what, what, what does that bring to your mind? If you just have this idea of who Trump is, you, ha you can you can be this president, this, this dollar, this buffoon, or you can just be complete Trump supporter, like Trump is going to break America great again, he's going to save us, he's going to do this and this. Where, where does that come? For somebody, that's just a word in English. That's just a word in the English language, meaning you're trumping something, you're over something. That could be it. For some people, that's failed businessman. For some people, that's very successful president. What does the, just that simple word, that simple thing itself means many different things. As I talked about before, when you say COVID-19, when you say coronavirus, when you say China virus, when you say Wuhan virus, when you say CCP virus, all these things mean different things to a lot of people. For some people, somehow their mind is literally wired that if you say China virus, they just think you are saying that because you're trying to be racist. Yet when somebody on CNN said China virus, that never actually sparked in their mind. But then all of a sudden Trump says it. Oh, man, that can be used for racism. It's, it's racist. 
So I gave that response kind of talking about that. Why did you use this uh, thing? And then, oh, you're tough. And then I'm going to read the thing. And then I went into a more detailed response, kind of talking about different points, addressing the thing, trying to give my point of view and where I'm coming from in this thing, talking about how I look forward for actual more facts and data to come in. I talked about how I don't think there's been enough information to back up what people have done, have been doing, or will do in the future. We're still waiting for information. We don't know the denominator. We don't know how many people have the virus. We don't know the actual details of what the virus actually does. We don't know the long-lasting influences of things. I've talked about that in the start, in the preamble, and here. And then I kind of talked about them how I think it's positive that despite the deaths, this will be a good learning point. The world is going to learn from this, not just the United States of America, but everyone. Then I asked him, I was like, okay, where are you coming from? What do, what do you personally think would improve the country? How do you think the country is actually failing? Why was this so tough for you to actually get through this article? And then he responded back with talking about how, oh, the critique about tough, he was focusing about tough, he told me about how he's a firefighter, how he's doing stuff like cutting, towing people out of cars, and how he's trying to save people, and how he's doing this and this, talking about the article was long, and things like this. And you see, that's the thing. It's more like he literally means figuratively. Maybe when he came out, he didn't want to actually say what he said. So what he, when he said what he said, I'm trying to understand where he was coming from. So he says, oh, he's three and fourths through, he thought it was too much bad news, he didn't want to read anymore, so he, he spends a large part of his day dealing with the reality of this virus and getting in this facility and killing half or more of the residents of where he is. So then he says, now what makes you even think you have a valid reason to throw any criticism my way? My answer was like, dude, you posted in a public group. <laughs> like, I'm also a human being. I can also post. I don't want to get through this back and forth of, oh, as of this, let's go in the progressive stack and the intersectionality and see whose points have more validity for me to speak on something. I'm going to check. And yeah, this this guy, this guy is posted. He, he is... He seems, he appears to be, he presents as a white male. He's, he's standing here, he's got a picture, he's standing by a plane. So he's somebody fly. So he has some money. You know, I could say, like, oh, you're a rich white male, you're not allowed to speak on these things. Me as an immigrant, like, uh, like Sub Saharan African, I should be able to. So you see all this stuff. No, 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 that, that's pointless. I think the facts are facts. Information is information. If you have something to say, say it. One thing I do think is positive, I have a separate video I tried to share with him called The Declaration of Your Dependence, where I looked at the United States of America and it was like, wow, this is an amazing place. This can be an amazing place. It still is an amazing place and it definitely can be an amazing place in the future. I am still very confident of that. And most of the things that were mentioned in this, the key, the key lines from that article that I actually pulled out that I want to repeat to you again that I completely agree with and think you guys should know and should think about, this goes, quote, and it should force a question that most Americans have never had to ask. Do we trust our leaders and one another enough to summon a collective response to a mortal threat? Are we still capable of self-government? Unquote. Now, let me break this down, because I think this is, from everything else in there, especially that last part, are we still capable of self-government? That is the key part. Everything else, to me, is just fluff and extra. But this is something that should be asked not just by Americans, but the rest of the world. Do you trust the leaders enough? Do you actually trust them? Do you actually think that this is the system that puts you in the best situation with all the resources and abilities that humans have in current year and heading out to the future? I don't think it is. I think a lot of people have been too complacent, in particular Americans, because they do have a lot of things. It is a post-scarcity society. So when I see people being like, oh, it's a failed state, I'm like, do you even know what a failed state is? Do you even can what a failed state is? <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you even state, bro? <laughs> but no, <laughs> they're like, oh, we need more government, we need more state. What does he mean? What does he mean when he says failed state? What does this guy mean when he means too tough to read? When he means too tough to read, that's something else, because he has all these other things in his life that he's seeing, and he gets a whole different point of view on that. Like, I have a different point of view in that. By you having your point of view and deciding you can come out and share it is valid enough for me to actually come out and give my point of view and then we have a share here. Like, I don't care about all this coming in like, oh, that as an X, I have more right to speak about Y than you because of Z. You know, facts are facts. Information is information. Anyone should be able to feel free to speak as they want to. If you aren't forcing me to listen to what you're saying or do anything based on what you said, then I don't care. Go ahead and speak. Go ahead and have your freedom of speech. Have it. That is an excellent thing. I think that is a key thing. If you had that, if you had that ability to share information all over the world, I think it would be a better place. If America, if the rest of the world could just have the American culture and society that it has today, not what it could be in the future that I think is a lot better, just today, I do think the world would be a better place. I also think that Larry, who posted this, would agree with that if I could talk to him enough about that. I also think that George, 
would agree with that in principle if I could talk to him about it. The problems would occur due to how we define what the country is today, how we define what needed to exist for it to be today, what needs to continue for it to improve in this way, and why other places are the way that they are. These are the things that I think would raise the problems, but let me know what you guys thought about this. It was a bit frustrating, but I'm glad I actually read it out again. And I think I think <laughs> maybe there's some maybe there's some good stuff here. I want you guys to check out the Declaration of Dependence video that I did because I read the in um, I read the Declaration of Your Independence, and I was looking around the United States of America and seeing the reaction of some people how they look at the country. I'm like, you're not seeing what I'm seeing. And some of the things you're saying, we need more government. But when they say government, they mean state. And I was talking about this before. I don't think I actually got to it. Maybe I did, but let me repeat it again. When uh, Tom Tom Woods is a libertarian, he's a libertarian historian, he has a podcast and I was listening to it and he put something in words that I'd been thinking about that was making me uneasy. Because people were like, oh, we need to listen to Fauci, we need to listen to Briggs, we need to listen to the scientists about the closing the things, about this and this and doing that and that. So Trump is not listening to these people. He doesn't actually want to, he just wants to open the country. He's too focused on the economy and this thing. And I was thinking like, okay, so who, those are the experts about the disease. So Trump shouldn't be talking about hydrochloroquine and all these other things and he should be listening to them about that. But when it comes to the actual society, how a economy works, how a society works, how a civilization works, how the system of laws work, how people interests work, how understanding, are there going to be riots in this area? What's going to be the long-term effect of this on these other things? Who are the experts? The scientists shouldn't have anything to say about that. Why, what makes you think Fauci and those people? But no, what they have to say can be valuable input to put into that situation. But it comes down to politicians because politics does exist. Leadership does exist. Laws do exist. Lawmakers and things like that do exist. Even as an anarcho-capitalist, I can accept that. But my problem is I do have a bias where I just associate all politics with the state. Because all politicians that we have right now are state creatures, are doing it under a state system. But even without the state, you can have politicians. You just have a better selective process to make sure you have the best people filling those positions. And when it comes down to it, there are certain decisions about the way the the, the body politic is actually working and organized, that you go to them to make those decisions after they've taken information from the experts and all the different things that you have to consider when making those decisions. I don't think George is an expert. I don't think Larry, who posted this, is an expert. I don't think I'm on an expert. And that's why I support a system that leads towards as much individualism as possible. So you are also free from any bad decision I might make. I don't want to be in a position where I can have so much power that my bad decision and my inability to actually grasp the situation that you personally might be going through, you and the people around you might be going through, should lead to your harm. At the same point, to have that system, it also has the inverse. You personally, if you make all the right decisions and I don't make enough right ones, you can end up gaining a massive amounts of wealth, way more than I can possibly get. But I want you to have that system where you can keep as much of that, even if it means me not having a fraction of it, as long as I am also insulated from the few times, those times that you do something horrifically wrong. You see what I'm saying here? I don't want us to just be all thrown together into one person. This whole characterization of Trump as just this despotic buffoon, like whatever, the <laughs> slim-suited, pale dilettante. That was excellent with the Jared Kushner thing. Love that insult. That was... That was, that was good, Mr. Packer. <laughs> that was good. But, but that was this video. It's a bit rambling. I, I like doing these kind of ramble rants things. I've been doing a little more of these where I actually just see something. Like, yeah, I'm just going to read it out and put it out there for you guys. So I'm going to post this up. Like, share, and subscribe. Links below to the merchandise store. There should be merchandise on the screen. I'm not yet quite sure what has been going on on the screen during this video. I'll probably put some of the drawings that I've done different things. I have an entire different series called uh, Trump Train to Magaland that goes over more of the political things. I have a specific one, Writing on the Wall, where I go and read different post-its that people put on the Union Square station, subway station after Trump won and try to understand this is what they literally wrote. What do they figuratively mean? I think this one is in that same vein, but then extended onto this huge article. But I mean, thanks for listening. I get some of this stuff can be a bit difficult. People are like, why am I spending this much time in I really do value the people that actually do take the time, and um, just, want, just want to thank you guys again. I'm, I'm thanking Larry for actually posting what he did because it led to this video and this back and forth. I sent all these things. We had these long, <laughs> rather long threads, a couple of paragraphs and things like this. And yeah, maybe Larry just doesn't have might have that much time, as he as he mentioned. He didn't have time to read the article. He doesn't think I have 
I mean, any position to give a valid opinion, a valid criticism in his opinion of what he was saying or why he was posting what he posted. Um, then after after these responses, after sharing the Declaration of Your Dependency, I was like, if you have time, check this out. He just asks, I, it seems like you're a Trump supporter. What, is it, what, what should that matter? <laughs> what should it matter? But to George, who wrote the article, to Larry, yes, I support Trump primarily because... I think he was uniquely somebody who would be the sort of person to lead to an article like that, to lead to an interaction to like the one we're having. I think if this had happened with Barack Obama, they would have kind of covered it up with the media. They would have covered for him. It would have covered some of the mistakes and problems that the inherent in the system of the state, and people would have continued to have trust in it. But it's good. People should question whether this is a system and we can improve. And she, she, purely because Trump is so divisive, he can do certain things, support certain things, say certain things, and people come out, people who would be protecting these things in some cases. Some of the media, for example, that would be shielding these institutions will come out and just jump in defense of them. People are coming out defending the Chinese Communist Party, for God's sakes. Who else would they, who else would make people actually come out this openly, as openly as they're doing and do it? Then later on enough, people will look back and say, wait, no, there's actually failures here. There's people actually I want right. And then people will lose trust maybe in the state system, and then they'll actually ask themselves, can we do more for ourselves? Should we really trust in these systems? And these questions are important. And I think him being somebody as a disruptor is one of my main supports from him. And thanks for listening. Like, share, and subscribe. Links below to the merchandise store. There's also a link for PayPal for one-time donations and things like that if you want to support me in other ways. I think I'm going to look at the Bitcoin as well. Anybody, eh, there was this thing in, this thing about opening Bitcoin wallet and things like that. What do you guys think about Bitcoin out there? So that's it for now. Goodbye. And thank you all one more time for taking your time.